Did you enjoy your time in the lobby? Were the requirements of your rider met? <laughs> <laughs> the, yes. In, waiting in the lobby was great. Hi, everyone. I'm Cami Chaos. And this, it, you always every want to time, jump on it. Every, every time, time I say, and this. I'm and this. Rick Tarosi, and this is the the crappy intro we do every time where we don't do the same intro twice. It's part of making it mildly interesting for you. Uh, Cami and I, obviously, mildly interesting people, which is, which is why we always go through the effort and work to bring you someone far more interesting to listen to for our show. So Cami, while he sits there uncomfortably, would you like to say things about our guest? I would. Yes, this is one of my favorite parts of the show. <laughs> right. I would, I would like to point out that this is a special 420 episode of Mildly Interesting People. And so we're talking to someone who I think is really freaking cool about something that I think is really freaking amazing. Um, and that is a part of my life. It's not the only thing we're going to talk to him about, but I would like to introduce you to our friend, the inventor the rocket scientist, the longtime school administrator. I'm not really sure how all of those fit together. Um, he is also a founder of a startup, which I I always think is a crazy thing to do. Um, more importantly, he just got married. And more importantly, he has a new kitten. So, <laughs> is that more important than marriage? <laughs> Maybe. Ask, ask your wife how she feels about the kitten. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so everyone, Sorry, new child. your yes. new child, everyone meet Mark Lewis, who is all the things that I just said he is and more. Mark, welcome to Mildly Interesting People. Well, thank you, Cammie and Rick. It's a pleasure to be here today. And hello to all your listeners, too. <laughs> you have done a crazy amount of interesting stuff in your life. <laughs> like, I was, ta- I was talking to our first guest. Uh, who uh-huh. we ever had on the show. And I was telling her, she thought I was joking. I was like, yeah, no, we're going to have a rocket scientist inventor uh, who created a uh, smokeless cannabis consumption solution. And she was like, you're so funny. And I was like, I can't, I can't make this stuff up. I'm talking about an actual <laughs> friend of ours. who's a rocket scientist inventor who created a smokeless <laughs> cannabis solution. Talk to me about your path in life. Like, oh gosh! What I'll, made you want to be a rocket scientist? I like blowing things up. <laughs> Maybe that's the short answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, as a child, I I did some model rocketry and I did little you know airplane engines and took apart lawnmowers and everything. So I was just a tinkerer from from early on, and so. Uh, and I was pretty successful academically. So, you know, the, the normal route was to then pursue math and science. It was sort of the expected route. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so I went to a pretty well-known um, science and engineering school. And then after that, uh, ended up working in aerospace for a huge space and communications group down in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was there for five years. And then that was just around the time of the Challenger Disaster, just to put some time frame, if anyone wants to do some some calculation (laughs) on the gray. (laughs) But then decided that I wanted to get into education, and there were too many barriers to get into education at that time. And um, so I went overseas with the Peace Corps. Uh, It was one of those two o'clock in the mornings, and Jerry Garcia Mm -hmm. ad came on. (laughs) I was with my brother at the time, and he had just come back from Nepal. And so, uh, yeah, so then I ended up joining the Peace Corps and uh, getting into and loving education. So I was a, a teacher um, in the jungles of, of Fiji Islands, um, mm-hmm. then came back, did my master's work in education, taught in the Seattle area for a while, um, and then met my ex-wife. And we went back overseas and uh, in the Peace Corps uh, mm-hmm. to the Kingdom of Tonga, which is a tiny South Pacific, one of, I think, only five or six kingdoms left in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were on a tiny little island about three days by boat away from the from the main island. So, um, yeah, so that was that. Then came back, did some education stuff uh, here, moved to Portland, where my ex-wife's identical twin was. Ah. Um, 
worked in Washington in the education system and then for a nonprofit and then got hired by the state uh, as the director of STEM education, uh, policy director for the governor uh, Mm -hmm. with the Oregon Education Investment Board. So back when that was a thing. (laughs) What, what, what was the, what was the appeal or like what, because my, I mean, I always say I can never be a teacher, but like my role has a lot to do, as you know, having experienced it has a lot to do with educating people or demystifying things. Like what was the inspiration or draw for you? Like what, what did you get out of education? What did it give back to you? Wow. Um, so similar to sort of the Peace Corps service, um, you know, oftentimes Peace Corps volunteers are, are looking for personal growth and development, uh, and they end up getting a, <laughs> feeling that they get a lot more from the experience than they give mm-hmm. uh, at the end of it. And, and those are profoundly personal experiences, uh, I think, for, for anybody who has gone through the Peace Corps, um, humbling because you're faced with, <laughs> you can't speak the language, you know, you don't know right. the cultural norms. You're right. kind of stripped of all of our own cultural, um, I guess, moorings mm-hmm. and, and you uh, are, are set adrift. And um, so you learn a lot about yourself. <laughs> yep. For education, I was driven largely by um, the fact that I knew the education system was not serving uh, a great deal of, of of the people that I, you know, it, it didn't serve me well, even though mm-hmm. I was successful at it. And I knew a lot of dropouts and other people in the education system who were highly intelligent, highly creative. And, and they just weren't being served by the, the structures of the educational system and, and what was expected of them. And I believed that I could do better. I could uh, stop boring uh, my students to death, you know, kind of uh, empower them to pursue what I felt was more appropriate from an education perspective. And that was mm-hmm. that, their own personal development. So I wanted to to really, my favorite students were the seniors uh, who were sitting there at the back of the class and were like, I dare you to teach me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it all. <laughs> I've survived. <laughs> so I, I awesome. love rocking their world. So. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. So from that, understanding your involvement in the Peace Corps, I kind of have a little more understanding of why you might choose to be a word that I can't spell entrepreneur. Mm. Um, <laughs> Too many E's. Can't spell it either. Too many yeah. E's. Yeah. I couldn't even think of the word. I was like, it's that one word. You can't spell it. Startup founder. <laughs> you don't like that one. And... <laughs> yeah. So Entrepreneurship. what? Entrepreneurship. It ex- what right. sh- what it. shifted in your life to transform into that big word? You've always tinkered, you said, and, and you are a, a creator and an inventor. And as I said yeah. before, a rocket scientist, which <laughs> at some point I want to get into what a rocket scientist just does every day. But yeah. what what prompted that shift? Because that's a huge, that's a huge change in life structure to go yeah. from being an educator to being an inventor and an entrepreneur. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm going to quote Jimmy Buffett here. If you're a Jimmy Buffett fan, uh, <laughs> that you know my occupational hazard being my occupation is just not around. Uh, having worked for uh, a lot of different, you know, I, I worked for the U.S. government. I worked for a large corporation in terms of the satellite. I worked for um, uh, you know school systems and and. I always felt like I was a, an outsider on the inside. And in fact, that's sort of my identity in those things was I wanted to transform. I wanted to be a, an agent of change from within. Um, you know, I, uh, yeah. So that was, that was, you know, where I had been. And, and after five years of working with the legislature and government and school systems, I was, I was actually talking to, I had, I'd been, uh, you know, keeping a list of inventions, uh, you know, and ideas and they would come to me. And, um, you know, uh, around that time I had, uh, I was really excited about some, some different things. And I was talking to a group of about 300 teachers and, 
And I was talking to them about, you know, uh, that curiosity and creativity, wonderment and awe, you know, and, and trying to really tap into that in themselves so that they can really feed themselves uh, before they try to nurture, you know, their students as well. And, and I just paused in the middle of my statement. I'd, I'd given that sort of speech before, um, but I just went, oh, shit, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, maybe I should start listening to myself. And so, yeah, that was really the impetus for for kind of letting go of the edge of the pool, um, mm-hmm. if you will, and uh, setting out uh, to bring some of those ideas to life uh, in a different way. And it was a great personal challenge because uh, entrepreneurship is kind of like joining the Peace, peace Corps. You know, you're, yeah. yep. you're problem solving every day. Uh, you don't often, I mean, you have support and structures, but it's also very um, individual. What surprised you most about yourself, about your capacity to be a founder, to be an entrepreneur, to kind of take on that challenge? Was there anything that it highlighted for you that you're like, holy shit, I can actually do this, even if it's a small part, like it's this part of being a founder that really drives me and I really enjoy and was somewhat unexpected? Well, I think for me, the animating idea that, you know, you, when you are struck by something that you can't let go of and you, you just have, there was this feeling like I cannot not bring this into the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that animating idea of, of replacing the lighter, you know, just took hold and said, wow, you know, and, uh, the, the larger, I guess, um, issue there was, was a desire, a a true desire to bring more, um, joy into the world, uh, Mm -hmm. if you will, and to help people manage their own health and well uh, better. So let's talk, because now we've touched on it. Let's talk about Pearl Labs. Let's talk sure. about the products that you create. Let's talk about yeah. just from the beginning, because I have iterations of of two products <laughs> sitting on the couch with me. I don't okay. have all the iterations, uh, but I've got the iterations of let's replace the lighter. I've got this one, which is not the first one, but it's one of the earlier models. It's one of the earliest. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I also have my little, I have a delightful little a uh, card here that is my certificate of authenticity for this one. <laughs> and I kept it because I was like, how cool is that? Uh, and then, that and then we've got this more recent modern, um, right. what I like to say, it looks like a lightsaber sex toy, but it's really <laughs> a replacement for a lighter <laughs> that allows you to have a smokeless experience with, right. a uh, smoke-free with, smoke. Yeah, right. cannabis or uh, any other herb of your choosing. Right. So, right. why was this the thing that you needed to invent? Like, why was why what what was it about just this? And and to be completely transparent, I can't stand smoking. Um, it, right. it it hurts my throat and lungs. So, I'm not asking you to sell me. I'm asking you to tell the world why did you think this need to come into the world? Was it um, a personal? Was it for you? Was it for yeah, at first it was personal, right? So uh, cannabis was just legalized here in Oregon. Um, I had uh, spent a large portion of my adult life um, kind of hiding my cannabis consumption because it wasn't accepted in the, well, certainly in the U.S. government or the state government or uh you know, just frowned upon uh, within society as a whole. I never identified as a stoner. um, And as part of that kind of heritage culture, um, not because I have any judgment of it, because I benefited greatly from (laughs) those who who saw it through in uh, from from Northern California in particular. I want to shout out to the Humboldt folks (laughs) for (laughs) For uh, yeah, keeping me supplied during college, um, <laughs> but it was never it yeah. So it was always one of those things that that wasn't so socially acceptable. And then when mm-hmm. it was, um, I had you know passed the fifty year mark in my own, and I was looking for something healthier. I didn't I didn't like the smoke. I, I liked being a bit curly, and I liked 
how um, cannabis uh, made me feel a little more creative, a little calmer, a little uh, more connected to the world and to myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were a lot of benefits from it. And I'd always questioned uh, the hypo hypocrisy of, of cannabis consumption in our or, or the social views on cannabis consumption in, in our society uh, at a time when, you know, alcohol is glorified, uh, right. whereas, right. you know, uh, people uh, joke about getting drunk and, and having a hangover. And, you know, I was just like, <laughs> you know, really? There's a better way. <laughs> all of the car deaths and all of these things. And as I yeah. learned, um, uh, you know, after the legalization, I started to explore the science of it. And really dive into the science and um, really revealed to myself that a lot of what we've been told is is a lie, you know, a myth. Um, there are some aspects that are have bits of truth in them, of course, but uh, the, the large portion of it was uh, was just blown out of proportion. You know, it's yeah. Yeah, I could see the benefit and the health benefits uh, for for many individuals. <laughs> I don't think it's a, it's not did a I secret. Yes, you did. It's not a secret to anyone who's currently on this recording. I don't think it's a big secret in general that I am a, uh, enjoyer and consumer of cannabis. Right. Um, it is, it's beautiful. Uh, there are times that I very much do identify as the stoner and I might as well just be dude from the big Lebowski. Uh, but for the most <laughs> part, that's not what I'm seeking. What I'm seeking is I, I have anxiety. I, uh, am neurodiverse. I have trouble processing things. And at the end of the day, I often have trouble unwinding and I don't want to, though I love a martini and I love a bourbon. Yeah. I, I don't want that feeling of that disconnects me from who I am and from myself. Um, and given the right strain of cannabis, it's an incredibly beautiful, self-connecting, creative experience, or it's just really helpful to let you sleep or unwind, or as Mark says, get curly. Um, <laughs> but I've always, I'm hyper aware of the social stigma. Now that my kid is out of the house, she's an adult, I don't have to worry so much about yeah. what so many people think, but there, there still very much is a huge stigma. Yeah. And I don't, what's well, our I way out of it? And well, you haven't been part if, of that, right, Rick? No, I, I haven't. Like I, recreational use here and there, but it's just not, it's not, uh, it just doesn't do, it doesn't have the same positive effect for me. Like uh -huh. it, it has an effect. It's just not an effect that I enjoy. Uh -huh. Um and and I will say the, the the paranoia has reduced greatly since legalization. So there's that part of it that's more. <laughs> that is a but, beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I think that's one thing that I, I didn't want to lose in this conversation is, you know, the the impact of the legalization of cannabis in a variety of states in the United States did two really interesting things from my perspective, even not as a regular user. And that was one, there were suddenly a whole bunch of people in my life who were comfortable being open with that was part of their lives like that. Right. And, and they, they, you know, like any other thing where you're kind of feel obligated to hide it because of social norms or mores or whatever, like that was a really beautiful part of that, that people finally got to say, no, I do use cannabis and, and it's legal and it's no different than alcohol. Like it, it's, it is what it is. And then the other thing I think I really appreciated about that, um, because I think so many people think of it as a you know, they think of the aspects of law enforcement or sure. whatever associated with the product. And I think the other part was suddenly there were a whole group of people who either had, you know, things they were looking to solve or ways they wanted to experience the world that that suddenly opened up a new avenue for them mm -hmm. to address those things in, in a, in a very positive way. And so, um, that's why I was intrigued by the work you were doing. Mark was just like, it had been part of your life and you were suddenly now allowed to make it part of you and part of your, part of your business and part of your pursuit. Um, what, cause I always, I always love asking founders this question. 
I'm the one who asked like five minute long questions, but we're finally That's getting right. to the question. Uh, that was a smooth one, segue, by the way. Yeah, Sorry, thanks. You, you made Thank that you. transition well. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. So, uh, what was what was that seemingly insignificant moment that caused the inspiration for the initial product, and and kind of where you've continued to evolve the product? Yeah, yeah. So the inspiration for the. Uh, at first, I didn't know much about vaporization. I had um, experienced a, a, an old school vaporizer many years ago. Um, and then when cannabis was legalized, I was like, oh, yeah, when I was looking for a, a healthier solution. Um, but I wasn't going to drop $400 on something that I didn't know whether it would work for me or not. Right. And so um, I bought a cheap $99 thing that looked like a Zippo. And um, I could never get it to work and I was frustrated and it broke, you know, in like two or three weeks. And so I was out in the little green shed, uh, <laughs> which is, was in my backyard, uh, the sort of the inventor space. Um, and, uh, I had my pipe there and I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, vaporization is just heating it up. What if I just, you know, had hot air instead of this lighter, you know, could that, you know, work. And I grabbed uh, a heat gun, which is like a condensed hairdryer, you know, mm -hmm. right? For yep. one of my <laughs> favorite <laughs> arts and crafts tools. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I put it over the pipe and it blew weed everywhere, <laughs> which I was just like, oh, I'll throttle back the fan. Uh, and I throttled back the fan and I got just a little bit of taste. And I was like, oh my God, I'm onto something. And mm -hmm. so that was, if I just replaced my lighter, that was the animating idea that, that then was, was what stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it was just a sort of a personal thing with my buddy, um, Josh and I, you know, playing around with a variety of different, uh, prototypes and approaches and things like that. And finally we got to one that we felt was, you know, usable by others when we called it the pong, because <laughs> quite literally I was making it out of a, a ping pong mold. Like I had made a, a mold ahead of, ahead of, you know, ping pong balls, <laughs> you know, and, and filled them with, you know, a dense ceramic and, uh, you know, used them as a, as the form. Um, but uh, we introduced it to another person in our network and, they tried it, put it on their pipe, and the look that came over their face was what we call the holy fuck moment. I can say that mm -hmm. on this, right? You're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know how to describe it because there's a there's a disbelief that people have when they first approach our products. It's like, huh, that's cool, that's interesting. Does it work? Oh, that can't work, <laughs> you know. And and so once they dial it in and and get that taste. Because that's what's surprising is that good cannabis has uh, some very rich and nuanced tastes that most people don't, uh, you know, realize. Um, mm -hmm. And so once you get a mouthful of that taste, it, it is, it's like, whoa, <laughs> I didn't know that cannabis could be like this. And so that look on that person's face and that pure joy and surprise is what then said, well, we, maybe we should bring this to market. <laughs> so, so that's where that came from. So the that's, first one was the Pong, and then the second was the Neo. Is this still called the Neo? Well, there was a. Yeah. Did you rename the Pong the Pearl, or like, because I, I can remember the yeah. little like black ball that you had. Oh yeah, so it went from the Pong to the Pearl, which was a black ball. Mm -hmm. um, that's our Pearl Sticker. Labs logo, yeah. right? So was we that had the a little. Inspiration? spaceship um orb uh, you know type of mm -hmm. a thing uh yep. that we were an, originally trying to do uh it turns out that just the thermodynamics and the power requirements makes that form factor not manufacturable um yep. so at this time we're running out of my first 401k that <laughs> you know was depleted <laughs> so like any good entrepreneur you you adapt or die right um mm -hmm. that's that's the name of entrepreneurship is adapt or die uh so uh we adapted we came out with then the ember um which is the wood version uh there 
that mm-hmm. that Cami has, which we loved the whole wood being from the Pacific Northwest, the aesthetic of of that sort of stainless steel nickel look with the mm-hmm. wood and then the and then the quartz chimney there, uh, along with the glow of the device really captivated us. So that aesthetic was important to us. Um, we made about 300 of, and sold about 300 of those and proved mm-hmm. out the product and that gave us, you know, grounds to, to raise our first hundred K and then, uh, you know, pursue something that was more easily manufactured, which we turned to then, um, ceramics and, mm-hmm. uh, the ceramic on the end of there is called zirconia and it's one of the most badass ceramics in the world. It's, it's basically, you know, the, <laughs> you know, you know, zircons, the, the fake diamonds. Yeah. 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 So, so this is basically made out of um, a polycrystallic structure, uh, you know, of, of fake diamonds. So, uh, you know, you can, <laughs> you can, and it's not going to break, you know, so uh, I, the court will I, break. I, I try to treat mine with a little more respect and dignity. Yeah, I that. know. That was just for respect. <laughs> stress, stress <laughs> testing. Yeah. How did that go over? <laughs> <laughs> it went well. Shocking. <laughs> so... When I first, so I, I should say, uh, Pearl Labs, the name of the company, was yeah. in an accelerator that Rick was overseeing. He's the right. program manager, founder, co-founder, blah, 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 for. And right. so I right. was very privileged that I got to try these things. And I remember the first time, like, hearing about the product, I was like, very much as you described, that's super cool, but that doesn't work. Um, and, then, work. and then I, I tried it and I couldn't get it to like, I couldn't get it to go. I was like, why won't this work? And Mark was kind enough to hop on a call with me where we discovered, I was like, Oh, what you just want me to do yoga breathing with a pipe in my mouth. I can do that. Um, yoga breaths. That's and it was key. really amazing, <laughs> but it was like really hard at first to like, you had to keep the mm, clamp yeah. down and you, and it got all really awkward. Um, and so I've got this one and I've used it for a while, but I was using it with a, a pipe from Miwa, not not one of the pipes that y'all use. And Mark was kind enough to send me their Turf Surfer, Turf mm. Surfer, Turf Turf Surfer. Yeah. You can just edit all the wrong ones. Terpenes, yeah. by the way, for yes. people who don't know about cannabis. So terpenes are just aromatics. They're the, you know, there's terpenes in everything. Oranges, yeah. there's, mm-hmm. you know, lavender. Terpenes are the smells, essentially. Um, and so I, I got to try this for the first time a couple of days ago. And you have leveled the way the fuck up. <laughs> That's all I can say. Part of the game, right? Level up. It, it, <laughs> like the, the experience now, I like to, uh, Mark's talking about the terpenes and the flavors. And this is, so it's a bamboo pipe with these Oops. amazing yeah. little magnetic spots to hold the little bowl on um and then you've got the is this still the neo what is this have a different name what the the the, have, the device are you talking about the silicon adapter no, no the device itself unit, the, is the, it the, still the, yeah, neo? the neo, okay. the, neo. Okay. the black okay. one is also the neo so yeah okay i just oh, wanted to make Cammy, sure i was Cammy calling will want the black version i know yeah. about the black version i'm mm, i'm yes. very I'm ha- I have my white one and it's beautiful and I love it. Don't stir up shit, sir. I just, I'm um, saying. So, so things like you added this cute little silicone, cute functional little silicone yeah. thing. And now everything just wor- like, you just pop it on and everything just works. Well, you like actually it. don't need that silicon seal for the turp surfer. So but I like it's it. designed to work without it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, so the, I feel less clumsy with it. Let me try without. Let's see. Because it just fits right into the uh, into that the bowl there. Because the nice. bowl was yeah. custom made for it. All right, I'll try it without. Right, no, right. Because we wanted the crystal. You know, just to go a little bit of a segue yeah. from a design perspective. Um, so there it is. This is like an air fryer for your pipe, essentially, yep. right? So yep. it's delivering hot air, powered by your own breath. When you inhale, it brings in the cold air, it heats it up, and then delivers it down through your herb. So Mm -hmm. the breath-powered is really important aspect of this. Another Mm -hmm. important piece for us was that most devices on the market, you put your herb inside of a chamber, and you have an app, and all of this other crap. And we wanted to really take the technology 
out of the equation, you shouldn't be fucking around with technology as part of your experience. You, yeah. you want technology that fades into the background after you learn about it. Sort of like I never think about my glasses, you know, right. when I put them on anymore, but initially I used to, you <laughs> know, like, Ooh, yeah. weird. Um, so yeah, so it fits on and then you inhale. So. All right. I'm going to try it without the silicone sleeve yeah. this time, but I oh. reserve the right to put it back because I like, I like the feel of it. The um, stability I, there. Right. Yeah. yeah. What we wanted to do with the quartz was so that you can always visually see your herb and see the mm -hmm. glow and see what's happening and stay connected. So for us, that connectivity was really important part of it. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the next part of the show, okay. Other which questions? is where... <laughs> there will be more questions. We're going to move on to the part of the show where Cammy deals with the fact that there's a stigma around marijuana and consumes cannabis on the show anyway. Because oh, it's, are you? Okay. It's a beautiful love part of my life with the Terp Surfer okay. and the Neo because genuinely uh, this is actually how I like to consume marijuana. It's not smoky. She's always in and, front of the camera. Edibles. Anytime she's like consuming, it's like, let me turn that camera on and film Ooh, myself. Take some pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's um, so much. Yeah. I mean, do I still have to heat it up? I know on the older models, I still heat it up out of habit. Yeah. I still you, heat it. The first time you use it, you, I mean, when you turn it on and it's cold, you go through a preheat cycle and let it heat nice. up. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, just to just to derail stuff, unless you're consuming as well, Mark, I don't want to um, prevent you. Um, this is an off the wall question, but you've met, you've mentioned music a few times. I know music is important to you, has been influential for you as a Seattleite. Are you sad you missed out on grunge? <laughs> Who says I missed out on grunge? I was gonna, like, Were I you don't still part of the? Okay, all right. I was like, was he in L.A. while that was going on? Like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, during the grunge scene, I was overseas. I think for ah. a lot of the grunge scene. Yeah, yep. yeah. So yeah. I did miss out on some of it. Yeah, uh -huh. it, it, that could be good. Yeah, just based no, based well, on you know. based on the artists you mentioned. <laughs> I'm not sure you missed much in terms of your musical <laughs> selection. <laughs> Okay. Kimmy, are you are you back? Are you? Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take another pull, but I want to discuss the the flavor. I want to discuss the experience. So, uh, no smoke, but it's that nice feeling. It I this tastes of lemon and pine, mm -hmm. uh, and it reminds me. I think it's the toasting from the from the quartz, but it makes me feel like I'm uh, consuming matcha. It's got that oh. like nice huh. toasty flavor. And I really enjoy that. I'm going to go in for another pull. Um, <laughs> and there is I'm vapor, so, so there's visible yeah. vapor as yeah. people could see as I exhale yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and what you're doing is you're heating up enough uh, to release all of the essential oils, all of the aromatics, the cannabinoids, mm -hmm. some of the flavonoids uh, as well, um, but without combustion. So in combustion, in smoke, like we've had the wildfires for a couple of summers now right, over the last right. five, five years. And uh, within smoke, you have ash, you have particulates and you mm -hmm. have tars and those and, and some other sort of toxic compounds uh, that are created when uh, these essential oils actually get burned. Uh, so you end up, you know, coating your lungs with those tars, the particulates um, get in there and lodge in there. So with, this way of consumption, you're not actually getting uh, the creation of those, uh, you know, toxic chemicals and certainly no ash. But you are exhaling vapor that is in particulate form, you know, mm -hmm. little particles, but they're fluid particles and they reflect the light and look like smoke, but they're not smoke. <laughs> Got it. Got it. There you go. Uh, if I science nerd on you, it just, yeah. I'm sorry, I'll do it. No, you know, we love it. Like that's... <laughs> That's what makes you wildly interesting is just your, like, not only your, the way you think about these things, but like, it's so amazing to just watch you light up and like geek out on shit. <laughs> like when you're, when you're talking about, well, this is how it actually works and, and all that kind of stuff. So I love that. 
You can just see like the little five-year-old Mark tinkering with a lawnmower, like coming out. He's like, this is a whole new experience. Let me tell you everything I know, because you're, <laughs> you're sharing something that you love with people who don't have that information. And it's, uh, yeah. Rick used a word to describe you earlier, jovial. You are the most jovial person we know. He's the most consistently jovial. Consistently person. jovial. It's, jovial. it's not like yeah. a and roller I'm not coaster. high all the time. Just to right. just to be clear about this, <laughs> Rick, Rick did wonder if that was I'm part of it. When I'm not high, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like I, but I think it, you know, to your earlier point, like it, it is, it's part of you. Like that, I always appreciate that about you. And Thank you. Um, I was so excited when. Uh, I learned that you have now kind of taken your entrepreneurship and your educational self and are now uh, working with startups as well, which, which right. if folks aren't, if folks aren't aware is another founder support organization here in, in Oregon. Tell us a little bit about what, what in, inspired you to, to engage more deeply there. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I think that part of my learnings from uh, in the Peace Corps and and mm -hmm. onward, it, and and you embody this so well, Rick. Uh, we talk about the effect of an ecosystem on the individuals who are part of that ecosystem, mm -hmm. as active participants in the ecosystem and affected by that ecosystem, right? And so from an education perspective, so I'm going to wind back. What my passion was, was not just getting that spark in, in students, um, and that spark in teachers, you know, so that they can feel that sense of joy again, that sense of play. Um, and for me, play, uh, stands fear and hesitation on its head. Mm -hmm. Play is the antidote to fear. Um, and when you think about it, and there's some really great research on this. So uh, for me, you know, creating an environment, a playful environment, a jovial environment, a, uh, an environment in which people can feel like they can take risks, uh, mm -hmm. that the the rules and those constraints have faded into the background and they are in the moment. Um, and for me, that's what I wanted to create within the educational ecosystem is break down those barriers between community and classroom, bring in business people, get the kids outside into nature, you know, um, have them talk to their parents and to other people and, and have older kids teach the younger kids. So, mm -hmm. so really push on broadening and diversifying, you know, diversity is the thing that drives innovation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when right. we become isolated, that's when we die. Right. And so for any healthy ecosystem, you have to drive diversity. Uh, and part of then my passion in building out uh, resilient ecosystems was transferred then into this business environment. And mm -hmm. one of the things, and, and actually from you, Rick, you know, is that's what attracted me to Pi to begin with is that mm -hmm. I'd heard about this crazy guy, Rick, who's, you know, helping, <laughs> uh, you know, build out the ecosystem. Um, and I was like, he really uses that word. I was like, <laughs> cause most, most people kind of, you know, right. really don't yeah. know what that entails, but you did and do. And so, um, I wanted to Starbucks was a similar type of, you know, mm -hmm. by founders for founders. It wasn't an incubator that had this structure and they were going to take 4% and they were going to, you know, try to, connect you with, you know, a marketing guru and, right. and that kind of, um, and, and some people can really benefit from that kind of a structural push. And I probably could have benefited from a little more of that <laughs> in my own, in my own journey and pathway. Um, but the idea of by founders for founders really attracted me to starve ups. So yep. they introduce, you know, around 10 companies a year, they've been going for around 20 years. And the whole idea is to support not just the early stage uh, entrepreneurs, but through the mid-year cycles and then through to transitioning to a successful exit. And their their data is just amazing uh, mm -hmm. about how many success stories that they have. And there's a selection bias <laughs> associated with that. Sure. And I'm very clear to point out to the board uh, that, uh, hey, yeah, okay, t pat yourself on the back, but... 
<laughs> there's still some things that we can do to diversify our uh, intake and and to uh, build out a, a stronger Starbucks community. So, so yeah. You, yeah. you built a, oh no, he built this segue for me and didn't even know it. Sorry, oh, I'm, sorry, Rick. Yeah, you you built a, a purpose answer. So. so there was there was one thing that I really wanted to talk about um, around cannabis and in the states that it's been legalized. And I just want to acknowledge that we're three middle aged white folks sitting around uh, yeah. talking about weed and uh, talking about invention. And what do you think the path forward looks like? So when marijuana was legalized in Oregon or in any state, the, a, a economy gets created around it. And yeah. unfortunately, in most cases, that economy that's created is around people who have the money to go through all these licensing processes and figure thing it, it make deals with the government, et cetera. So you have a lot of people who've been imprisoned for crimes that are no longer even a crime um, and yeah. who don't have the resources and backing to make their way forward in, in a legalized culture when that's what they've always done for a living. Do you think there's a path forward there? Do you, first of all, I just wanted to say it because I think it needs to be acknowledged because it's bullshit. Yes. Uh, secondly, you're now, you are now a professional in the cannabis world. What do you think is a path forward? What do you think we can do to make it a more accessible path for people who've been wronged by the justice system in the past? Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, thank you for introducing this topic because it was on my list to bring in oh, <laughs> as okay. well. Maybe um, you did know you were building in my segue. <laughs> well, I, I think there's a moral imperative for any company within the cannabis community right now to, um, to help uh, redress the wrongs of the past because the, the, this, um, this entire sort of segment of the marketplace is really built on a lot of injustice that uh, negatively impacted predominantly black and brown people um, in different ways, in different states, uh, for different economic pressures uh, that might have existed in their worlds. Um, and, you know, I'm lower socioeconomic <laughs> income, but I also had, um, you know, structures and networks that supported me. Uh, and I, I and I acknowledge those advantages, and I want to make sure that you know we, as a company, and and uh, again everybody in the cannabis space address this. So I, I we're very strong um, supporters of of the Last Prisoner Project, which is seeking to move pr prisoners who were wrongfully incarcerated. Uh, very supportive of any effort for expungement. Um, these things are, you know, for nonviolent, violent offenders, of course, uh, if they're cannabis related crimes, I think they, they not, you know, not just release them from prison, but uh, expunge their records because their records are, are carried with them for life. So, th so that's at a basic level, you know, that has to happen. Okay. Um, beyond that, we need to do a lot more to make sure that there are opportunities, that there are funding avenues for um, women and, and uh, you know, entrepreneurs of color to start their businesses. And Oregon, I, my sense uh, from the early days of the Oregon marketplace, uh, there was a very strong push um, and an, an ethos that was shared by a lot of people that I had talked to. And I, that formed my, uh, understanding my learning, my belief system. So uh, a thank you to all of those people who helped uh, educate me. Um, but it's changed uh, as the influx of multinationals, other multinational, um, multi-state, not multinational. There are some multinationals uh, at play as as uh, big tobacco gets involved um, and big alcohol gets involved. But uh, the multi-state operators with um, investment in Oregon, uh, you know, are are having an undue influence, and it's getting uh, wider again and and more male again. And it yeah. didn't used to be that way uh, in the early days. Um, so, so I think there needs to be a lot more uh, investment uh, on the part of the state to build this. Uh, you know, uh, build this industry. Uh, it's a huge industry for the state, a huge mm -hmm. revenue generation. Um, and, and it, 
and we have the best weed in the world. So uh, we can also have a great brand there. Um, but we haven't done a great job on, on issues of uh, diversity and equity and, and inclusion. New York is trying some, some interesting experiments uh, with withholding licenses or, or holding aside licenses um, for uh, businesses of color and giving them supports to get established. And I think that that's going to be a really interesting to see how that goes. So there's a, that's the yes. start of an answer. It's that's a lot a start more. Of an, the, yeah. This is, um, it's, it's not really an answerable question. I mean, it's such a deep problem, but we're not going to ever solve it if we don't start at least talking about it. So thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. If you have some resources that uh, you could share with us, Rick will link them up so that we can make sure yeah. that everyone is aware of what we can be doing as conscientious consumers um, mm -hmm. yeah. to not be uh, racist and sexist and awful when it, and there's, there's gotta be a word for like, when you're, yeah, I'm going to, I'm unfair. It's not yeah. fair. Not um, fair. <laughs> and I, I mean that with all of my heart. You and nailed now, one of our core principles of our company is fairness. Yes. <laughs> like, let's be fair. Let's all not right. be dicks. <laughs> well, let's just not suck. Don't be a dick. Right. Don't, don't let's, suck. Just, <laughs> let's be okay. Be, be kind. Yeah. All right, Mark Lewis. Okay. It's time for the lightning round question. Uh -oh. It's the lightning round. Oh, Are you uh, ready? So, yes. What's your favorite aphorism? No. I'm going to ask That's you lightning. No. Oh, you're asking me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Don't try, and, don't try and turn the tables on us. <laughs> we've, been, we've been fooled once guessed. by that. Yes. <laughs> Our last guest did. She fooled yeah. us. Fool us once. Shame on us. <laughs> okay. Mark, what is your favorite but least useful hobby? Yeah, Wordle. Quartle. Oh, nice. Quartle. Yeah, what's, if you don't know what's the word game. I know Wordle? what Wordle is. What's Quartle? Quartle is, is four Wordles at once. Ah. And then Octortle is eight Wordles at once. Yeah. You're into some yeah. serious shit, man. Yeah, right. that's my morning. My morning routine <laughs> is to get my coffee and skim the, the doom scroll of the news and yep. and then turn to <laughs> lighter pursuits and, and play some word games. Yeah. Wordle is the salvation. There you go. Would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? Oh, hell yeah. I'm a survivor. Mm. So I, um, yeah, that's, yeah. It is I don't possible. Want to get too serious. <laughs> yeah. It's possible that we're just doing this podcast so that I can ask cool people to be on my zombie apocalypse team. On our survival team. Yeah, yeah. I'm not He's a prepper. I'm not a prepper like that. I don't have a, a bug out kit, but when Trump was first elected, I did consider. Yeah. Creating yeah. that and ready to, to head to the hills. You yeah. don't have to. You don't have to actively be a weird prepper or anything. We just, you know, agree that we should meet up during the zombie apocalypse so that we can defend ourselves against the hordes, and then we'll have. I'm there with you, man. You on our side, okay? I've got awesome. my water Mark, filter. Yeah, yes. Mark is like your Mark is your BA Baracus for your zombie A team. He's the guy who comes up with all the contraptions and shit. Yes. MacGyver. Yes. <laughs> Every yes. team needs a MacGyver. <laughs> You're my MacGyver. I love it. Okay. Uh, we're keeping Rick, by the way, as a chef, if anyone wonders. Ooh, a oh. chef? Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to be without his cooking yeah. skills. He's very nice. Pretty. All right. Next question. What is the I last just arm candy? <laughs> He's that too. He is awfully pretty. He doesn't like yeah. it when I say so. <laughs> Oh, look at your face just turned the same color as the light behind you. It's getting darker. Boy. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay. So it's mine now. I'm embarrassed. Or embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I watch all the time. I, I read up. Okay. All right. What is the last food you photographed? Um, besides cat food, right? <laughs> no, cat, cat, cat food, food counts. Cat food's a good answer. That's a great. No one's ever said that. Cat food. Check. Right? Cat food or sushi the other night. We, nice. we went to Wajamaya and got some blocks of beautiful fish and made some lovely little sushi plates. So that's my, we did that that's... for Christmas Eve. That's going to be our new tradition this year. Oh, or, nice. It was last year, and it's going to be a tradition now. I love I that. Have a hard time with, I have a hard time with sushi during cold weather. Like, I always crave sushi oh. when it gets warm, but, like, not as much nice. when it's warm. I will Do you guys go to Saburo's then at all? No. Do you order up from Saburo there in Selwood? 
Wouldn't no, their roles are too big. They're gigantic. <laughs> their roles they are, are huge. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Zenbu. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Zenbu. Oh, amazing. Everything we used to live around the corner from them. Yeah. 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 We used to live walking distance from them as well. We no longer, we move. So no oh. more Zenbu. But we get a lot of fresh fish from Ujamaya and I make my own poke because I will eat sushi and poke no matter the season. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Anytime. All right. Speaking of seasons. Okay. What's the best season? Yeah. yeah there's only one answer. For me. Well, there's one and a half answers. Uh, fall. Fall for sure is my mm-hmm. favorite uh, time of the year. I was born in November. Maybe that's it. But I love, I feel so alive when the world starts to humble you <laughs> with, with that wind and the great skies that we have here and, and the smells. It's just, I feel very alive. Um, for me, it's the crispy leaves under my feet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's just so many senses. And then the other sensory wonderland is right now, right? Uh, with the, mm-hmm. the new blooms, the new smells. Uh, just breathe deep. Uh, yeah. New colors in the world. So, so that's my other half. Okay. Spring would be a close second. Uh, and then I already know the answer to this one. But <laughs> magnets or stickers? Well, it depends on the context, right? So if you're looking for, for decorations or com- commemorating something, or you've got like, wait a minute. <laughs> One moment, please. One moment, ah, please. Nice. You've got a nice. Right of different stickers. Um, so, <laughs> right. Or, or there's a time and a place. So I've always sure. loved stickers, right. Mm-hmm. For decorating things. Um, but, you know, there's there's a permanence there and you got to be committed. It's kind of like a tattoo. Right. That. Oh, my God. Magnets. So I'm a mag, I, you know, magnets yeah. trumpet for me. I, like, it's very sciencey. Magnets are like the first fun science you learn as a kid. It's like a mystery. Mm-hmm. How the hell right. does that work? Yep. You know, it's, it's like alien technology. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Cool. Especially yeah. when you reverse it and then it hovers because... Magnets mm-hmm. can also repel people. Science rocks. Science yeah. rocks. <laughs> okay. So science There's one... matter, that math counts. Oh, uh, that mm, was so mm. fucking nerdy and funny, and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right, Rick. Was Rick, there another yes. one? Is there another question? I no, you answered all five. Is that it? You did. Yeah, yeah. you did. You, See, did, great. you did good. You, had, you even had right. props. Yes. To bring into the shot. No yeah, one's had great. props. There you go. Yeah. Rick. So, yes. What strikes you about this show? Wrap it up. Say nice things about Mark. Tell the people where they can find him. Okay. Uh, so we'll we'll link this up so that you can uh, see the amazing products that that Mark and his company build. Um, and we'll also link up Starvups if you're a founder who's interested in that peer to peer support. It's a great organization that i've been a huge fan of and uh, i'm just absolutely psyched that mark is taking more of an active leadership role there uh i i will say that so often you know in the work that i do it can be like it can be a lot to be a founder and um and it's stress and it's, I don't know what's going to happen next and i don't know how to deal with this and and just mark always amazed me with just his optimism and joy that he brought to doing the work, because I think so much of that is driven by his vision and his passion and, and what he knows needs to exist. And for cannabis users, even at its early stage, he has changed the world for, for people who consume cannabis in the, in the absolute most positive way, which is why we're just thrilled that he was able to join us for the 420 show. Mark, uh, you do amazing work. I have a huge amount of respect for you. Uh, and I just, I keep doing what you're doing and, and keep improving the world for people because we're, we're a better world because of you. 
So thank you. Oh, thank you. And back at you, Rick and Cammy. Uh, you're so wonderful. And I've learned so much from you and with you alongside you. Um, and I, I love what you're doing here by connecting the dots uh, in, in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Because I've learned so much about other dots in your network by watching <laughs> your show and going, oh, my God, I want to meet that person. Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been hiding them, Rick? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, well, that's the idea, right? It's like, wow, all these people in our network are super interesting, far more interesting than us. So we should put them out there so other people can encounter them, for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Well, all right. Again. Well, Let's wrap it up, kids. People have got things to do. It's 420. They should go celebrate in whatever way they choose to celebrate 420. That's and right. this uh, is pre recorded, by the way. Yeah, shh, shh. <laughs> That's movie magic. We're supposed to be like live oh, and stuff. Sorry. So Don't pull no it. worries. No worries. Somehow we're, uh, somehow we're typing while we're talking and you're not seeing us. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's amazing. It's amazing. So it's a, wet wire we have into our brains for the typing. <laughs> All right. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this has been Mildly Interesting People with our, with our wildly interesting guest, Mark Lewis. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.